Hello. Okay. Uh, so I'll start. Um, I'm Neil Roberts. I work at Egalia. I'm going to be talking about um, embedded graphics drivers in Misa. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief overview of just graphics in general. Um, and then I'm going to uh, do another overview of the graphics stack in Linux. Um, and then uh, present Misa and uh, the architecture of Misa. Um, and then finally, uh, some of the embedded drivers that are available in Misa. Um, Okay, so uh, GPUs, um, the basic idea of a GPU obviously is to, um, it's a device that um, has, you give it um, uh, some graphics memory with, a, with an image in it and it does something to uh, uh, scan that image out onto the display device. Um, so that's the minimum uh, support that uh, a GPU needs to do. Um, so obviously uh, GPUs have been uh, becoming um, progressively more, com more complicated. Um, so uh, these days um, they're basically pretty much uh, general purpose processors um, that you can use to run arbitrary programs. So uh, we call them shaders uh, in the graphics world. Um, so, so yeah, the, the, the GPU can basically run arbitrary programs, um, but they're um, specialized, uh, the, uh, the different from the programs that you run on the CPU, because uh, the GPU is designed to be highly threaded, um, so it can operate on multiple um, inputs at the same time, and the, each of those threads as well uh, are also uh, use uh, SIMD, so it's um, single input, multiple data, single instruction, sorry, multiple data. Uh, so um, you can have um, many, many calls, many, many, many threads running at the same time, and each of those threads could do, for example, the equivalent of um, uh, doing 16 operations at a time, whereas on the CPU you might have, say, four cores, and uh, generally each core would only be doing uh, one operation at a time in an instruction. So, yeah, the, the GPU is multipurpose, but highly optimized uh, for doing um, highly... Um, Paralyzable tasks. Um, so I, I say that the GPU is um, these days is is generally just uh, completely programmable, but um, it still contains uh, a lot of fixed function um, graphics specific um, capabilities. So obviously it's got the the, the um, graphics connector to connect to the display, and it also has hardware to do things like uh, texture sampling. Uh, so when you render um, some geometry and you want to put uh, an image on that um, geometry, it has special hardware to rapidly access um, images, textures, and uh, do filtering and scaling on, 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 on the textures. Uh, it has other specific hardware, um, specific hardware features like uh, uh, primitive assembly. Uh, so if you give it a list of triangles, um, um, it knows how to take uh, a list of vertices and convert them into um, separate triangles. And for example, if you draw a triangle that is partially off the screen, it knows how to cut that triangle up um, and generate more triangles so that uh, the only triangles that are available are the ones on the screen. So yeah, it still has a lot of fixed function pieces as well. Um, Okay, so that's just the, the general idea of a modern GPU, and now I'll talk about the, um, the graphics stack in Linux. Um, so uh, this is a slightly modified diagram from Wikipedia. Um, so at the top left, you have uh, your application, which uh, for interesting applications, it's uh, usually a game, um, and that uh, uses... Um, so for any application, a normal application, even if it's not using any 3D, uh, would use um, either the Wayland protocol or the X11 protocol uh, to uh, create its windows and uh, handle its input. So uh, an application using 3D will still use uh, one of these protocols. So either um, it will use uh, either the Wayland protocol or the X11 protocol to talk to um, the thing managing the display. So that is traditionally the X server, but nowadays it can just be um, a Wayland compositor as well. Uh, so the application directly communicates that, communicates with that um, over, over a, um, an IPC mechanism. Um, and then uh, it also talks uh, to Misa. So Misa is just a library. So when I say talking, I just mean it's calling uh, API calls. 
Um, so, and it will use one of the standard graphics APIs, which uh, basically means either Vulkan or OpenGL. Um, so the idea with Misa is it's an implementation of uh, these two graphics APIs so that um, a game could be written for, obviously for one of these APIs, not directly written for Misa, um, and uh, it can work on other platforms as well, uh, such as on Windows or uh, another implementation of the API. Uh, and uh, so Misa does the work of um, translating those API calls uh, in, this, in the graphics API um, into system calls to talk to uh, the kernel driver um, and the, so the, the part in the kernel will handle um, uh, allocating the actual buffers uh, on the graphics memory or programming the registers on the GPU. Um, and there's also the other side, uh, the, on, on the left of the diagram, there's the KMS. Uh, that's kernel mode setting. That's the bit that um, sets up the display um, with the, the right resolution and configuration and tells it to where to read from. So when you've finished uh, with the GPU rendering into a buffer, um, that will be passed off into KMS, and KMS will tell the display hardware to scan out from that particular buffer. Um, okay, so that's an overview of the, uh, the next graphics. Um, so, so the main thing I'm, I want to talk about is those two APIs, because uh, that's the bit that uh, Misa handles. Um, so uh, start with a, a short history of uh, OpenGL. Um, so uh, the first version of OpenGL was released in 1992, uh, OpenGL 1.0. Um, it was a very different beast um, in those days. So it was designed um, around the graphics hardware of the day, which was uh, very fixed functionality. So it's not like uh, what I was saying before, where the, the graphics device is highly programmable. It, it really is just... Um, uh, a fixed piece of hardware to draw triangles with um, um, with programmable registers to set the color for the um, the, the triangles, for example. Um, so the API reflected that. Um, so, so this is a, a short code snippet showing example of how you would use the uh, original OpenGL API. So you really just it's lots of API calls. So you have an API to um, set the color for the subsequent vertices. Um, and then you have an API call to uh, set a position, for example, or set other attributes on um, each of the vertices. And as far as I understand, in the original SGI hardware, that more or less translated into uh, poking registers for um, whenever you call these fixed function uh, APIs. Um, OK, so um, that has changed um, in OpenGL. So all the way, even in way back in 2004, OpenGL 2.0 was released, um, and that uh, changed everything uh, to introduce the concept of shaders. So that is starting down the path of um, making the API programmable to take advantage of uh, programmable graphics hardware. So now, um, instead of just saying, I want this triangle to be in this color, or I want these vertices to be transformed with this matrix, you can write a short program and give it to the um, OpenGL implementation and say, uh, when you want to work out the color, do these calculations for me, and that will be your color. And the same for transforming the vertices. You can say, transform it in exactly this way. Um, yeah, and the OpenGL was um, very progressive at the time because uh, um, yeah, yeah, it used a really high-level language, GLSL, which is close to C. Um, so it is, uh, supports uh, a, lo a lot higher level constructs, such as ifs and while loops, that uh, weren't necessarily easy to do on the hardware of the day. Um, but they, yeah, it was great that they did that. It's really forward thinking for hardware that can really handle that well now. Um, OK, so yeah, this is just an example of a DLSL shader. Uh, just one line. Um, it, uh, um, GL frag color, that is a variable that's going to represent the, the color of the fragment we're calculating. So this is a fragment shader to calculate the color of the fragment. Uh, it assigns to this GL frag color to say the, the ultimate color of the fragment. And it's just doing a little calculation there to, to work out a color based on the position of the fragment in the screen. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, in the, so after GL 2.0, OpenGL has been continuously progressing and um, getting more and more biased towards the programmable part rather than the fixed function part. And more and more of the new functionality is just implemented in GLSL, so in the entirely programmable part. And um, more and more bits of the fixed function API um, that were in OpenGL 1.1 uh, slowly being deprecated and disappearing. So it's, it's really just becoming an API uh, that helps you pass off calculations onto the GPU. Um, so the, the other major thing uh, with, uh, since, that has changed since OpenGL 1.0 is that when you specify your input data, so for example, when you specify uh, your vertices, rather than uh, calling a, a function call for each vertex, um, you really want to try and minimize the amount of uh, function calls you do now. So in, uh, instead, you tend to try and put everything in a buffer. Um, so you might have a, a really big buffer containing all the data for your vertices. And instead of calling a function for each one of those vertices, you just point uh, OpenGL to the buffer, and then you call just a couple of API calls uh, to describe the layout um, of, of the, vert of the uh, vertex data in that buffer. Uh, and then you can reuse that layout and reuse that buffer multiple times. So instead of every time you want to draw a complicated model with like thousands of vertices, instead of doing thousands of calls, you just um, have an object representing the, the, that state and that buffer, and you just say, okay, draw that thing again, like you did last time. Um, so there's a lot less API overhead. Um, so uh, as well as a uh, desktop OpenGL, the original OpenGL, uh, at some point there was, they were released um, OpenGL ES. So that is for um, embedded devices. Um, so the, the idea is that, uh, yeah, OpenGL has, uh, because it has a long history, it's built up uh, a lot of stuff that um, doesn't really make sense on modern hardware or just never really made sense on hardware at all. And it is just like, um, um, uh, like a convenience library, which is a strange thing to have in a library that's meant to be um, a specification where there would be multiple implementations. So the idea with OpenGLS is to remove all of the stuff um, that uh, is difficult to implement on embedded hardware and just all the stuff, all the legacy stuff that in general is just not really related to hardware. Um, so the, so um, there's, there's two versions, there's EL, uh, OpenGL, GLES 1.0, which is similar to the GL 1.0 idea of, of having fixed function hardware. And then there's a um, GLES 2 uh, and 3, they're basically the same, um, which is using the programmable hardware as well. Uh, so these days, OpenGLES and um, the modern versions of OpenGL have really the same ideas in mind because uh, the OpenGL uh, 4 and um, 4.6, the latest version, is really trying to get rid of um, the old ways of doing things uh, the same way that OpenGLES has tried to remove them. So they're converging quite a lot. Um, but the difference is that, uh, yeah, OpenGL um, really has a lot of things that are for high-powered GPUs, and the GLES uh, is more reluctant to add things to the API that uh, are difficult to implement on low power uh, embedded devices. Um, okay, so that's the summary of OpenGL. Uh, so um, now we have the shiny new API as well, uh, Vulkan. Um, so Vulkan was released uh, in 2016. Um, it's basically a progression from the frustrations that uh, developers have of using uh, OpenGL. Um, it's a completely clean break from the API of OpenGL, uh, so it is, removes all of the old things that don't make sense anymore. Um, and the, the, the main idea is that it is as close to the hardware as possible. So it really is just like the minimum abstraction you can have over the, the different um, hardware, um, and it, but it, it tries to uh, not have any um, like intelligence or any try and try to do things automatically for your application. It, it, it just presents the hardware as it is. Um, so uh, the, um, the great power comes with great responsibility. And um, so now with uh, Vulkan, 
uh, you, the application has the responsibility to manage um, the buffers and the synchronization by itself. So for example, OpenGL would um, do a lot of helpful magic for you. Say for example, if you render to a texture um, and then you later use that texture as a source in, in a subsequent render, GL will know that you've, um, you were previously writing to that and now you want to read from it. So it will do whatever magic is necessary to make that uh, reading block until the writing is finished. Whereas, uh, uh, so the problem with that, of course, is that um, it, there's a lot of magic going on in OpenGL behind the scenes, and it's difficult for an application to know exactly what's going on. So it can't, um, it's difficult to get the most efficiency out of the hardware. So whereas with Vulkan, um, it, it doesn't have any guarantees. If you write to a texture and then try and read from it and it's not ready yet, it will just go wrong. It's your problem. Um, so you have to explicitly tell it all the synchronization points. And when you allocate a buffer, you have to make sure that that buffer is alive until the GPU is finished with it. And um, yeah, so there's a lot more power. Um, so of course, Vulkan is uh, harder to use, um, but uh, it, it um, yeah, it gives you a lot more opportunity to uh, take advantage of the hardware. So in these days, I, I think um, it's the right way to go because um, anyway, when you're using OpenGL with a, with a modern application, most of the time you're going to be using some upper layers like Unity or whatever to make a, a simplified um, interface for the game developer. So uh, it's better to put all of the, the common um, management of, of the buffers and everything into something like Unity rather than making all the driver implementers implement it um, and then taking away the flexibility from the application developers. So the other thing with Vulkan is that um, it uh, basically replaces both OpenGL and OpenGL ES. Um, it's designed with um, embedded hardware in mind right from the outset. So um, I think when they were designing Vulkan, they made sure that um, it, it, it doesn't do anything that doesn't also make sense on embedded hardware, because a lot of embedded hardware works in a different way um, with a very limited amount of memory, and for example, renders only a small section called the tile um, the, of, of the rendering um, uh, yeah, with the limited memory. So it needs, Vulkan was designed from the outset to make sure that kind of thing is fine in the API. Um, and the other thing it does is uh, uh, when you implement um, a certain version of Vulkan, you're saying that there's like a minimum amount of support you can do, but then even features that are in the Vulkan core can be optional. So if you have um, uh, some complicated hardware feature um, that's difficult to implement in, on an embedded device, uh, you can still implement Vulkan, but you can say, I don't support this particular thing. So it, it is really um, the future API to replace, to, to rule them all. So, um, okay, so that, that's the two uh, main graphics APIs. Um, so um, yeah, as I was saying, in um, the Linux land, uh, these APIs, um, uh, are implemented by Misa, so I'm going to represent Misa, uh, present Misa. Um, so Misa is an open source implementation of um, OpenGL and Vulkan, of, of the OpenGL and Vulkan specifications. Um, it works on a variety of hardware, and um, it's a user space library. As I was just saying, it's a user space library that interacts with the, the kernel driver via system calls. And so it was originally started um, in 1995 to implement version 1.0. Um, and they originally only used software rendering, um, but it was designed in such a way that um, it could support uh, hardware rendering in future, and uh, that's really paid off. And uh, now, um, in the modern Mesa, really the, the hardware is the most important thing, and the, 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 the software implementations uh, are, are more like a, as a fallback if, if you can't get the hardware to work. Um, so we're 19 versions later in those uh, 20 years, um, around version 19.2. Um, so yeah, Misa contains uh, a lot of drivers for all sorts of uh, different hardware. I th uh, uh, I, I, do you think the main original open source one is the, the Intel driver? 
Um, but there's now open source drivers for um, AMD Radeon hardware, NVIDIA, um, and uh, embedded devices like the Broadcom and the Qualcomm. Um, and of course, it still has software renderers. Um, it, it now has multiple of them, which have uh, different advantages. Um, okay. Uh, so for a long time, uh, Mesa was really behind the curve um, with the OpenGL spec. Um, it, it took a long time to catch up to OpenGL 3 and to, to implement geometry shaders. But lately, um, it really is on the, the cutting edge. And um, the developers that work on Mesa, they're directly involved in the um, in Kronos. So Kronos is the organization that looks after OpenGL. And they're, they're right on the, 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 the cutting edge and helping to shape OpenGL as well. So Mesa now supports uh, OpenGL 4.6, the latest version, and OpenGL ES, latest version, and the latest version of Vulkan as well. Um, so I say that Mesa supports these, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the drivers in Mesa support them. Uh, so uh, each driver can advertise what extensions it supports, and um, those, uh, those capabilities, those extensions, uh, Mesa uses that to work out what uh, version of OpenGL to advertise when you use that particular driver. So different drivers have uh, different versions of OpenGL. Uh, so there's a, a handy website, uh, which if you want to, it's called uh, mesomatrix.com, I think. Um, if you go here, you can uh, see what particular versions each driver um, supports in Mesa. Um, so you can see the base Mesa supports uh, GL 4.6, and I think the Intel driver i965 is the, currently the only one to support uh, GL 4.6. Okay, so now uh, talk about um, the internal architecture of Mesa. So um, you have your application on the left. It is going to be using one of the APIs, um, the graphics API. So in this example, uh, I'm going to show for the OpenGL API. Uh, so that just calls the OpenGL function calls. Um, and then there's a state tracker in Mesa, which um, does the initial um, tracking of, of the state for uh, those function calls. So for example, when you bind the texture, it keeps track of what, which texture you were bound, uh, was bound. So yeah, I have to say uh, the OpenGL API, it's, it's, very, it's implemented like um, a big global blob of state. So uh, it's like uh, you, you, you set a, a color, and then that's the color for the rest of the operations. So it's really just like flicking switches on a big graphics machine. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the initial Mesa straight tracker keeps track of which switches you switched um, from that big state device. Um, so then there's the DRI, the direct rendering interface, which is like um, a big struct with um, a load of function call pointers um, to, to um, uh, call back into the driver. So the Mesa state tracker really does, just does the minimal um, uh, handling of the API to to uh, translate that down into something more manageable for the drivers. Um, like, for example, it uh, unifies OpenGL ES and OpenGL uh, into the same uh, callbacks. Um, so uh, for the, uh, uh, the Intel driver, because it was one of the first drivers in Mesa, um, that is just directly implementing that big table of function pointers, the DRI interface. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, it just implements DRI directly. Uh, but then uh, the, a more modern way to implement a driver in Mesa is to use a thing called Gallium. Uh, so Gallium is like um, it's, it's meant to be like um, a, a really low-level graphics API uh, that you can implement. Um, so you, you just have your driver implement this really low-level graphics API. Um, and then um, uh, the, uh, you can imp the Gallium module on top of that will, will translate the uh, DRI calls, or effectively translate uh, your, your upper-level API, your OpenGL, into this really low-level API, which is really convenient to implement um, on, on your, um, in your back-end driver. So, uh, um, I think the, the, the Gallium, it handles things like uh, when you, so, so mostly when you, uh, the hardware, uh, when you program all these 
state things, um, it doesn't, that's not really how the hardware works. What you tend to do is have like a, a buffer with a structure um, which has all the state, uh, and then you just tell the hardware, now look at my state from this uh, buffer. Um, so you, you really want to, whenever something programs some state, you want to be able to put that into a buffer. Um, and then you might have multiple different states uh, in an application, so that might end up being multiple different buffers. And I think Gallium can help you cache uh, the different, different sets of switches that someone has programmed in the, with the OpenGL API uh, to make so that it's easier to translate that into different sets of buffers that you can tell the hardware to use. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of common code for doing the state caching that Gallium can handle for you. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it's common code, so there's no need to implement it in every driver. Um, so Misa works out which driver to use by uh, using a, a kernel API to um, uh, query the, the, the PCI ID, uh, and then it has a big table of the drivers, and it picks the driver based on that. Um, and if that fails, uh, it can always fall back to one of the software renderers. Um, so I, th I think this slide covers what I said uh, before. Um, so uh, in a, as I was saying, the, the modern uh, hardware is basically um, just um, a big programmable um, multipurpose machine. So uh, when you're working in graphics, um, a large part of what you're doing is actually nothing to do with graphics, and you end up working in compilers instead. Um, so the, um, a major part of the driver is um, is a, is a compiler to compile the GLSL uh, to your native uh, hardware instruction set. Um, so this is just an overview of, of how that works in Misa. So um, you have your GLSL shader coming in on the top left. Um, Misa immediately uh, converts that into an abstract syntax tree, which is just like a tree in memory representation of the shader. Um, it will convert that down to GLSL IR, which is like a, a high level uh, Im intermediate representation, so that um, instead of just being a tree, it's, well, it's still a tree, but it's um, instructions, and it, it, it knows when you have a, a variable name, it knows what variable you're actually referring to. Um, and that gets uh, lowered again down to something called NIR, um, NIR, which is, I think, new intermediate representation. Um, and that is much lower, so it's no longer a tree, it's just a sequence of instructions. Uh, and if you know some compiler theory, it can use SSA as well. Um, so uh, that, that is really quite a, a low level uh, representation of the shader, and uh, many of the optimizations um, for, in Misa happen there. Um, so uh, by the time you've finished with your NER, you've got really quite a good optimized representation of the shader. So now um, a lot of the drivers just uh, directly take that NER representation and translate it to their, um, their machine instructions. So that happens, for example, with the Free Junior driver and the Intel driver. Um, but uh, I think uh, a lot of the Gallium drivers, uh, perhaps you could say it's the old way of doing it as well, is to use a, another intermediate language called TGSI, which I guess is meant to be um, an intermediate representation just f f for, um, for Gallium. Um, and yeah, that, uh, the, the TGSI implementation can do even more optimizations on the shader. And uh, so some of the drivers directly translate from TGSI, and yet it, other drivers do even another step and uh, pass that TGSI into LLVM, and uh, LLVM is, um, is a separate compiler project which is really meant to be for um, CPUs, um, and, uh, but it has a, a whole lot of work going on, obviously, and it uh, has a lot of optimizations. So um, if the drivers can take advantage of that, I guess that's good, but yeah, the problem is it is meant for uh, CPUs, so uh, sometimes it does things that aren't appropriate for the GPU, because, for example, the GPU, because of the way it uses SIMD, um, it doesn't do loops and branches in the same way. Um, so if LLVM is assuming 
that it can just do jumps, uh, it's not going to work for the GPU. Um, so I think um, generally that's being phased out, um, and um, I think the, the, the Radian driver, for example, that is using LLVM, is they have a project to do a new driver which doesn't use LLVM, a new compiler. Um, okay. Um, so I just saw some, some examples of those uh, IR representations. So if we take this simple DLSL shader, which uh, just calculates the color using a logarithm, I don't know why, but it does that. Um, and uh, when you convert that into DLSL IR, um, it looks something like this. So you can see um, it's still quite close to the DLSL, so it's represented as a tree. So there's like uh, uh, that um, addition operation is, um, yeah, it's represented as a tree with the sub-expressions and so on. Uh, so uh, eventually that will get uh, converted down to a NER representation. So now you can see uh, it's no longer a tree. Um, it's really just a sequence of operations. And uh, each operation has a, uh, a result, the SSA value, uh, and the subsequent uh, instructions can use uh, the results of those other operations to do further op operations. And you can see uh, there's no assignment anymore. The assignment, the assignment has disappeared, so it, it, it uh, tries to get rid of all the variables and um, just do um, yeah, a, a linear sequence of operations as much as possible. Um, so uh, eventually that's going to get converted down to um, the hardware instruction set. So this is an example uh, on the Intel i965 driver. Uh, and you can see now, uh, as part of the translation from NER, we've got actual register numbers in there. So part of the, the, the work of the driver of um, converting from NER is to allocate register numbers to each of those intermediate operations. And as you can see, um, that 16 in brackets at the end of every opcode, um, that means uh, to do each operation 16 times simultaneously. So that's what we mean by a SIMD instruction. So each add there um, is going to do uh, 16 adds simultaneously. So if you imagine the fragment shader, um, it could work on a four by four grid of fragments and uh, operate and have a single thread uh, calculate the color for um, all of those 16 fragments at the same time. Um, OK. so. Onto the point of the talk, which was to talk about um, embedded drivers. So, uh, just um, a brief mention of the existing embedded drivers that are already in Misa. Um, so, we have the Freeduino driver, which is for the Qualcomm Arduino devices. Um, it was started in 2012 by Rob Clark, um, and it's a reverse engineered driver, um, which means that um, uh, Rob. Uh, um, had the existing binary closed source driver um, and uh, gave it um, uh, example uh, shaders and uh, examined what uh, compiled code came out of the end of the binary driver and what registers it poked um, and compared and made tweaks, enough tweaks to the inputs until he could figure out what happened on the outputs. Uh, and with that information, that's enough information to try and work out how, what the actual hardware does and then implement an entirely new driver. So the driver now is in a really good state. It implements GL 3.1 and DLS 3.1, and it's in active development by Google uh, and us at Egalia. Um, so it's in quite a few devices. Um, it's in a few, it's in the, the Nexus phones and the, Pixel 3a, for example, uh, and you can, divide, you can buy um, development boards um, with this Qualcomm chip in. Um, so there's also the, the VC4 driver, um, which is uh, for Broadcom Video Core 4 GPUs. Uh, so the main interesting use for that is in the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so that was written by Eric Anholt when he was working at Broadcom. Um, and unlike um, the Freeduino driver, this came out of Broadcom releasing the documents for the GPU, so they didn't need to have reverse engineering. Um, it was implemented um, with, with the spec, um, and that's also in a good state. It supports OpenGLF 3.1, um, and it's also under con continuous development. Um, 
and also Egalia is working on that as well. Um, so in the same vein, uh, we have uh, a driver for the video core 6 GPU, which is in the latest Raspberry Pi. Um, apparently, it's a very different architecture from the video core 4, um, so it really needs um, a new driver um, that was also started by Eric Ganholt and is being continued by Egalia. Um, Okay, and there's also the, the Panfrost driver for the ARM Mali GPUs. Um, it's used in some Chromebooks. Uh, this is another reverse engineering uh, task started by Elisa Rosenzweig. And um, it has recently been merged into Misa Master, and apparently ARM has made some contributions to it too now. Um, so in the last XDC, so the X Developers Conference uh, in 2019, uh, there was a... a um, a lightning talk show uh, demoing uh, Panfrost running desktop GL 2.0, so it's looking pretty good, and they're looking to support OpenGL 3 and Vulkan. Uh, and that's an image which obviously proves that Panfrost works, because there's a picture of SuperTaxCat, but that's a picture I stole from the lightning talk. <laughs> um, okay, I think uh, that's all. Um, thanks. <laughs> Is there any questions? You didn't mention Vivante in your list of drivers. Is that dead? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, or, yeah, basically what the state of the Ednaviv free driver. Um, yeah, I, I didn't miss it out on purpose. I just, uh, I, I don't know enough about it to, <laughs> to mention it, but uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Can you go to uh, five, slide five? Uh, can try it. It's the... Yeah. Oops. Yeah, this one. Uh, can you describe how is... For example, we have uh, some uh, compositor like Wayland or X uh, server. Let's say we have Wayland. How it's done if we use uh, hardware compositing for Wayland? Do we have some uh, connection between Wayland and, uh, for example, Mesa, or we have uh, just, uh, or we just communicate with user using this uh, lower layer between? Uh, yeah. So yeah, uh, the the, work, the compositor is using Mesa as well, and um, yeah. So. I guess I could have drawn a line across as well uh, from the compositor up to Mesa 3D. So I guess the, the way that works is um, uh, when, when you use um, the, the um, Mesa these days, you can just directly render it into a buffer. So you don't really need to, it doesn't really need to be related to the display. So you can just say, um, allocate um, enough memory in, in the graphics memory to, to have to contain the image, and then you can say, uh, render into that, please. Uh, so it's possible to have an application that doesn't rely on the, a compositor or a display server. So I guess you could consider uh, a Wayland compositor to be an application that, uh, to begin with, it doesn't necessarily use the display. It just renders into a buffer. But then it also has the know-how to give that to the display server, uh, to the display controller and make that scan out. Um, okay, thanks. Um, what about uh, Tegra? Are we stuck with the blob, or is uh, NVIDIA has recently started to release documentation? Does, does that help? Um, yeah, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid that I don't, I can't. Uh, I don't have enough information to, <laughs> to update on that. <laughs> so uh, very quickly to answer the question on, uh, on Tegra. So Nouveau does support, uh, I think, Tegra K1 and Tegra X1. 
uh, to their full extent and MESA. Uh, so that includes kernel and MESA as well. Um, after that, it's a little bit stale, sadly. But uh, but yeah, for older SOCs, you have you have good support actually. Thank you. Um, what is uh, the motiv motivation behind that? I mean, we are using native driver for embedded system, and uh, why do I should use that, in fact? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I mean, what is the ma motivation be 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 uh, behind the MESA 3D? We are using, for embedded system, I mean, uh, we are using uh, the native drivers from the vendor, in fact, uh, normally. And why should I use the MESA? I mean, what are, what are the benefits? Oh, do you mean what's the benefits of MESA on top of just using a binary driver? Yep. Um, well, I guess <laughs> you could get into a philosophical question of whether you value open source. Um, I guess I would say having an open source implementation is, is great. Um, uh, yeah, I guess um, if you're um, a game developer, um, I get the impression that a lot of the times there's bugs in um, closed source drivers and it is uh, difficult to get support if you're just like an independent game developer. And a lot of the times I, I, I think I hear stories that um, it is really helpful to be able to look into the code and see exactly what the driver is doing and figure out that why isn't this working? This is supposed to, I'm doing what the spec is telling me to do. Why isn't this working? And um, yeah, I think um, it is a practical uh, help as well to, to have the open to have the code to, to try and work out what the driver's doing. Um, yeah. do, do you have benchmarks compared to the native drivers? Does it work well? Um, I don't have any benchmarks off the top of my head, but um, I guess it depends on the, the drivers. I mean, I guess because, um, uh, well, I don't know about the embedded drivers, but the Intel driver, for example, is developed by Intel, so it is really they know the hardware and it is really performant. Um, uh, I guess the Broadcom driver as well. Um, so yeah, I guess it varies from the hardware. I mean, I guess uh, the reverse engineered projects, they're always gonna be a, a step behind because just the, the way it works, um, you need to wait until the, the, the driver is out. Um, and uh, it's really hard to do something better than the blob driver if you're just, um, prodding the blob, driver, the blob driver to see how it works. Um, so yeah, it depends on the driver, but I think most of them are good. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, so um, the issue of um, uh, open source graphics drivers is, is something that's very close to my heart. Uh, I work mostly uh, with Android and doing Android porting. And um, the main advantage of having an open source driver is that you get the source code, you can compile it for whichever uh, kernel you want, whichever uh, platform you want. You're not stuck with just the uh, version that was compiled by the, uh, by the vendor. So from my point of view, that means I can then choose my kernel. I can then co compile uh, the, uh, the graphics driver which, with whichever kernel I want. I'm not stuck with whatever uh, the vendor gives me. Uh, and the other big news here, I think, is that Google are really behind this. So, so far as I understand, Google have mandated that all Pixel devices will run MISA 3D. They don't want any uh, closed source uh, graphics drivers on, on Pixel devices. Certainly that's the case of the Pixel 3a, as you, as you had on the slide. So far as I understand, but I haven't checked, it's also the case of the Pixel 4, um, but that'll be interesting to, uh, to check that out. So yeah, open source graphics have come a long way in the last, whatever, seven years. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I, I think we've run out of time. So. Thank you. <laughs>